I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. <sighs> the rapture is going to be in a twinkling of an eye. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Did Paul ever speak like this? Never. We are in the Old Testament. This is what's going to come back in the 70th week, Daniel's 70th week in Revelation. I'd like to officially welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. So before we get started, let's pray. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam noten veshomerek varech lelamed leadrichut leenhot otanu bederek sheba aleinu lalechet eleidet perhat eneinu ozaneinu vilevno leman timsor lanu merachmatek yediatra uvunatech ונירת נפלאות מתורתך, שרוע הקודש שלך את תנחת כולנו אל כל האמת, ברכת לימוד המילה שלך בשם ישוע. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go, by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to pick it up from uh, one of the last lines of last week. I basically said, we are reaching and coming so close to that finish line. And you're probably wondering, what am I talking about? What finish line are we coming to? I'm talking about calling good evil and evil good. This is what's basically hitting us right now around the world. These are our days culminating to the days just like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Just before God's judgment hit them hard between their eyes. And believe me, they never saw it coming. Look at what God says through Isaiah, chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good. Is there anybody out there that's calling evil good? Think about what you're saying. If you have a slither of your conscience left, what are you saying? If something is evil, it's evil. When you're playing cards and it's an ace of spades, do you call it a four hearts? Absolutely not. You call an ace of spades when it's an ace of spades. If it's good, you call it good. If it's evil, you call it evil. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You're walking on your heads because that's what it is. Everything is just upside down. You might say, but this is already here. What I'm saying is this. We haven't seen the worst of it yet. There's still too much goodness in the world. There's still things that are good that people are still calling good. But the days are slowly approaching because they already started. What is good is evil. What is evil is good. But eventually it's going to overtake it. Then what? When the culmination of this and other evils will be widespread, amongst other things, and is full, there's going to be a destruction from the Lord to cleanse and clear the land of that particular cancer. The world is having a heyday right now. Go have your fun. Your days are counted. Because the land that's going to be cleansed, we're talking about the whole earth. And I'm going to give you some examples. So I want you to turn with me now to Luke chapter 17. We'll start reading in verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Evil was good, and good was evil in the days of Noah. Now question, how was it in the days of Noah? It was so bad that God had to clear the land. Now He cleared the whole earth. What's coming up? The same thing will happen. God is going to clear the whole earth, not by water. It's going to be one massive war. And whoever is going to be left are going to be the righteous people. They're going to be walking into the kingdom. Verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Evil was good, and good was evil in the days of Lot. Now question, how was it in the days of Lot? It was so bad that God had to literally clear the land. He burnt everything down to the ground. You might be saying, why did He burn everything down to the ground? When you have sodomy, immoral sexuality, people get sick, they get all kinds of diseases. And the best way to rid yourself of a disease is by actually burning it. The minute you burn it out, you're killing the viruses, the bacteria, the whatever it is, you're killing everything. And God deemed it, this is the best way to clear out this particular piece of land. And that's exactly what He did. In verse 29, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. 
Evil is good, good is evil. God's going to be clearing the land very soon. Everybody is freaking out. They know that something is up. They don't know what it is. Everybody's turning to the Bible. Everybody's starting to look to God. Everybody's looking, okay, what's happening here? And everybody's just asking questions. God is getting ready to clear the land. On what side of the fence are you on? If you're on God's side, He is going to protect you. If you're on the other side of the fence, may the Lord have mercy on your poor, pitiful soul. That's all I can say. The time of Jacob's trouble is found in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. The time of the heathen is found in Ezekiel chapter 30 and verse 3. Is when God will cleanse the land again and get it ready for the millennial reign of Messiah. That's coming up. It's around the corner. Jesus shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. The judgment of the nations. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 25. These are the prophecies that Jesus gave to Peter, James and John on the Mount of Olives. When shall these things be? The end of the world and the sign of you coming back. Chapter 25 is going to give you the judgment of the nations. You can also find this in Revelation 19. When Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to be fighting against the whole world. I'd like everybody to turn to Matthew chapter 13, verses 39 and 40. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. Now notice, in this end of the world, basically meaning the world as we presently know it not the destruction of earth. Now the definition of the world, the fifth definition is present state of existence as while we are in the world. The 19th definition, the carnal state or corruption of the earth as the present evil world. The course of this world, you'll find this in Galatians 1 and Ephesians 2. Look at verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. We're talking about a cleansing of the land and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When a man sees evil as good and good as evil, and they make the laws of the land to reflect this, where evil is good and good is evil, that's the downfall of that particular nation. And if you notice, these laws are happening all over the world. So the world is decaying in front of your eyes. The reason that the world is still in a state that it's in, it's because of the righteous people that are in it. And I'm talking about the believers in Christ. You might say this is a little bit far-fetched. Uh, no, it isn't. Remember back in the days of Abraham, Genesis chapter 18. The Lord told Abraham that he was going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew that his nephew Lot was in the city. And he said, Lord, if you find 50 righteous people, will you destroy those two cities? For 50, I won't do it. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities, villages around about. 45, 40, 35, 30. He went all the way down to 10. And the Lord said, if I find 10 righteous people, I will spare those two cities. There can be one righteous person in your nation. That nation is being spared because of that one person. You think you're having fun and God can't do anything to me. No, the only reason God is withholding judgment from you, it's because of that one righteous person. The righteousness that the believer has in the church is the righteousness that was each transferred to us. It was imputed in us. And the righteousness that I have is not my own. It's the one that the Lord gave me. Because of this righteousness, God is keeping a bunch of losers alive. There's a bunch of losers that deserve judgment to be hit like this and like this. And the Lord is holding back that judgment. Why? Because of that one righteous person. Righteous people are all around the world. You put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, good for you because you're probably keeping that nation up and going. But what happens now is that when you start loving good as evil and evil as good, this encourages people, especially with the laws that are being made in these lands, encourages people to love evil and hate the good. And because of this, it starts stirring their sin within them. All of a sudden now they want to start doing those bad things. And it's just getting ready for the Antichrist. It's just getting ready for the seven year tribulation. When you have certain groups that flaunt their evil lifestyles, saying, there's nothing wrong in what I'm doing, and they promote their evil with their parades. My question to them is, what do you base your morality on? What set of principles do you set your morality on? We've already seen in Romans chapter 1, God gives His take on it. And just to refresh your memory, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1 verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds, 
and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for their own women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of debt, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Getting back to Job now. His salvation did not rest in being born again, spiritually circumcised and the Holy Spirit being sealed in him. This did not exist in the Old Testament. This does not exist from Hebrews all the way up to the end of the Bible. If you would take Acts chapter 8 all the way to Philemon and you remove those writings, there's no rapture, there's no sealing of the Spirit, there is no church, there's no salvation by grace, and everything that Paul taught, you're just taking all of that out. There is none of that. You just remove three quarters of the debates that are going on in the world right now. Job did not have this. In the tribulation, in Daniel's 70th week, in Revelation, you don't have the spiritual circumcision. You don't have the sealing of the Spirit. You don't have these things. Job said that his salvation was due to what he did, not what God did. Now question, how did Job put on righteousness and it clothed him? It's the works that he did to secure his own righteousness. That's where he had it. I want you to turn to Job chapter 29 and start reading in verse 12. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. All of these things that he did, it was the good works that he was doing for himself before God for his salvation. My judgment was my robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind and feet was I to the lame. I was a father to the poor and the cause which I knew not I searched out. And I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. Job was doing something. Go to Job 33 and verse 26 now. He shall pray unto God and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy. For he, speaking of God, will render unto man, underline this, his righteousness. When you compare this to Paul, it's the righteousness of God that was imputed on me, that it was he transferred to me. I want you to turn to Psalm 4 and verse 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. When did Paul ever speak like this? Put your trust in the Lord, yes but never offer the sacrifices of righteousness. The sacrifice of my righteousness was 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on that cross. That's the sacrifice that was offered for me. So when did Paul ever speak like this? That's right, never. I want you to turn to Psalm 7, verse 8. The Lord shall judge the people. And look what it says, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to mine integrity that is in me. Turn to Psalm 106, 3 now. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Did Paul ever speak like this? Never. We are in the Old Testament. This is what's going to come back in the 70th week, Daniel's 70th week in Revelation. You're going to have to do your righteousness at all times. You cannot slack on it. Let's look at another one. I want you to turn to Proverbs 11 verse 4. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. That's what's going to deliver you from death. The physical death, the second death, which is basically being thrown into the lake of fire. Turn with me now to Ezekiel chapter 18. Start reading in verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Notice the words. The righteousness, the works that the righteous does, it's going to be on him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, 
he shall not die. Let me repeat this. If the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed. I'm repeating this for a specific reason. Look at the next words now. And keep all my statutes. Oh, I got to keep his statutes and do that which is lawful and right. This is tied into your righteousness when you're actually going to be working it out. He shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness, underline that, in his righteousness that he hath done, shall he live. Do you see how the righteousness in the Old Testament actually works out? It's a righteousness, it's a work that you have to do. This is what James is talking about. Faith without works is dead. What is he saying? You have faith, but you're going to have to prove it with your own works. What he's talking about is the verses that we just finished seeing in the Old Testament. Let's keep going. By keeping all of God's statutes in verse 21 is a self-righteousness or work which is performed or done by you to establish your own righteousness. Jump down to verse 26 in Ezekiel 18. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, Understand, when a righteous man, a man who's been doing good up to that point, and he turns away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his own soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live and not die. Do you understand what that means? You lived 99 years being the perfect person. This morning you got up and you screwed something up. There's unrighteousness now. There's a blot on you. And you say, you know what? I'm going to take care of this tomorrow to bring in whatever sacrifice or whatever it is that I need to get done. But you die that night. The 99 years of good that you've done will not be remembered. In your sin, you're going to die. What about the person that lived like Hitler for 99 years? And in the morning he gets up and his conscience is burning at him. He says, you know what, I better take care of this. And he does whatever sacrifices that are basically needed for him to wipe away all of the unrighteousness that he's done. And that night he dies. The 99 years of living like crap and being the piece of, you, you know what I'm talking about, person that you are, but you made yourself right with God that morning and you die that night. All your unrighteousnesses will not be remembered. It's that last thing that you did. That's what's working your own righteousness. That's why we are living in the best dispensation. This is what you need to understand. We're saved by grace. It's a righteousness that's been imputed on me. It's the gift of righteousness according to what Paul said in Romans chapter 5 verse 17, 18 around there. Let's look at another passage. Ezekiel chapter 33, start reading in verse 12. Therefore thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. The day that you sin, all the goodness that you've done will be forgotten. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. The day that the wicked man turns from his wickedness and he starts doing righteousness, whatever bad he's done will be forgotten. God looks at the last second of your life. What state is your mind? What state is your heart? That's what he's looking at, not what you've done in the past. Do you understand where I'm reading from? I'm reading in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is not in the church. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. The day that you sin, you're fried on both sides. Did Paul ever preach, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression? No, he didn't. This is not the gospel of grace. What dispensation are you in? You're in Ezekiel. Paul, what dispensation are you in? You need to understand what was written to you in your particular time period. The minute you start mixing and mashing, nothing makes sense. And there's 106,000 denominations out there thinking that everybody is right. Yes, but I got this out of the Bible. Big freaking tickle. Didn't Paul say to rightly divide the word? It's like the chicken that was walking down the farmer's porch and the chicken came to a bowl of beaten eggs. And you know what the chicken said? What a bowl of mixed up kids. What does that mean? This is not a Caesar salad. You cannot take stuff from here, there, and everywhere. It does not make sense. Let's keep reading in verse 13. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and commit inequity, 
all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Do you understand what that's saying? Look at verse 14, again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, you're going to live. God looks at the last second of your life. The minute you die, that you breathe your last breath, what condition, what state were you in? In a righteous or unrighteous state? He's not going to look at the rest of your life. That's why you got to live righteously every millisecond of your life. Do you know why? Because you don't know when you're going to breathe your last breath. That's why you got to make sure that you're always on the mark. If you're not on the mark, you are going to lose it. Your soul and basically in hell. Whatever good you've done gets cancelled the second you sin. Whatever bad you've done gets cancelled the second you make it right. This is in the Old Testament. This is going to be in Revelation. This is going to be in Daniel's 70th week. This is not part of the church. Once you understand this, you can start understanding how the Bible is actually laid out. These saints are saved under Old Testament ground rules. The righteousness done by the Old Testament saint did not guarantee him a continual safety or salvation. You could not have been eternally secure in the Old Testament. So the thing of that you can lose your salvation, you have an Old Testament mentality, you're taking that and you're cramming it down my throat. I am in the church, I am in the body of Christ, you're taking an Old Testament ground rule and you're shoving it down the throat of the church. You can't do that. Understand where you are when you're reading. Who is writing? To who is the person writing? If something that you're actually reading contradicts Paul, take what Paul said, you can't go wrong. His safety and salvation in the Old Testament was only guaranteed if they persevered in their righteousness at all times. That's how they were eternally secure. But the minute they screwed up, you just got fried and buried. There's no two ways about it. You have to have persevered till the day that you died. The last second, when you breathe that last, God's looking, was he righteous or unrighteous? That's what he's looking at. This is what's going to be happening in Daniel's 70th week. This is what it means working out your salvation. In Daniel's 70th week, in the tribulation, that's what it means. Working out our salvation here in this dispensation under the church, that's something else. And everything I just finished saying, it fits in line in Matthew chapter 24 that says, you have to endure to the end. Your righteousness, you got to endure to the end. Not only not taking the mark, but everything that goes with it. The context is the tribulation. There is no eternal security to the Old Testament saint, nor is there any eternal security for the person living in Daniel's 70th week or in Revelation. Paul never preached this to the church. The believer in Christ had to endure to the end. We have nothing to endure. It was something that was imputed in me. You understand what that means? I know I put a lot in your plate tonight. Probably verses that you didn't know even existed in the Bible. These are verses that I knew. That's why I believed you could have lost your salvation. I kept going to these verses. Until one day, one guy told me, he goes, who is Ezekiel writing to? Under whose gospel are you saved under? That's when all of a sudden the lights started going on. That's when a duck started lining up. All of a sudden the Bible started making sense. He made me memorize 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He goes, your problem, Frank, is that you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You're taking stuff that's intended for other people. That's why you're all mixed up in your head. I'm going to stop this here for this week. I got a few more verses I'm going to cover next week. Basically, just bring everything together. The New Testament, the Old Testament righteousness. Tonight, we actually saw a lot of the Old Testament righteousness. And remember one thing. It is the last thing that you do before you breathe your last breath that God's going to be looking at. Was it righteous or was it unrighteous? We just finished reading it in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33. And everything we just finished reading about the righteousness in the Old Testament is going to come back in Revelation, in Daniel's 70th week. That's the point I want to make. That's why today is the day of salvation for you. We're still in 2023. Today is the day of salvation. You're getting saved under the best dispensation. God gives you the gift of righteousness, something that He imputes in you. You don't have to work your way to heaven. This is the best gift that God can actually give you. So have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we'll see each other next week. 
So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on his name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.